So I'm not late this time. I received my equipment a few days ago and for the last five days, I've been grinding on it to get all the tests and the benchmarks out so that I can release this video as soon as possible. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the Ryzen Threadripper 7960X. But before we go too far ahead, I would like to thank a couple of people for making this video possible. First, AMD for sending the CPU, the 7960X, then to Gigabyte for sending both the TRX50 Aero as well as the Aero 4060. I'd like to thank Kingston for sending the RAM. The SSDs were thanks to Crucial who sent three of the T700 one terabytes. The PSU from Raid Max, the cooler and case from NZXT, and then the thermal paste from Thermal Grizzly. While waiting for all my benchmarks and my renders to complete, I find myself with quite a bit of spare time on my hands. So I snuck over to YouTube to see what other reviewers were saying about the series. Obviously they were on AMD's early release. I'm not, so that's why I'm only releasing it now. But I feel that the whole point of the series was lost on a lot of reviewers. And these reviewers have a lot more knowledge and resource than myself. So take it where it comes from. But it's kind of like we got caught up in a case of what can the CPU do rather than what it should do. First of all, the CPU is not designed for gaming. And when I went and looked at other reviews, that was the first thing that I saw, gaming benchmarks. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a very good indicator of a CPU's performance, especially when doing it on 1080p, because that's going to stretch the CPU. But it's kind of like the movie Gremlins, if you've ever watched Gremlins, or maybe I'm too old, but saying, do not get it wet or do not feed it after 12. The first thing that we did when we got the CPU was we got the Mogwai wet and now we deal with the problem because people are focusing on the wrong aspects of the CPU. So while I have the benchmarks and the tests that you want to see out of the CPU, the whole point of this review is to actually convey the message that I think AMD was going for when they were designing the CPU. But in order to appreciate all of the benchmarks and tests, we have to understand the specs as well as the topology. So we're going to jump into that now. Firstly on specs, I'd like to look at the topology of the CPU. Now what you see in front of you is the topology of the series itself, but the 7960X will have to minus a couple of CCDs here because it has four CCDs and it has six CPUs per core and 32 megabytes of L3 cache per core. So it only has the four CCDs and then 6X4. Currently, there are three motherboards compatible with the Ryzen Threadripper 7000 series. For ASUS, it's the Pro WS TRX50 Sage Wi-Fi. For ASRock, it's the TRX50 WS. And for Gigabyte, it's the TRX50 Aero D, which is the motherboard we used for the 7960. Now, these motherboards use RDIMM DDR5. There are two best options on the market at the moment, being G-Skill and Kingston. We use Kingston for our review, but we use the 6000 rated RDIMM from Kingston. We will use the 6400 at a later stage. So the codename for the CPU series is Storm Peak and it's under the Zen 4 architecture. The number of cores is 24 with 48 threads and it does have SMT or multi-threading. The base clock starts at 4.2 gigahertz and boosts up to 5.3. This is a bit of an anomaly, but we'll get to that in the results. The L1 cache is 1.5 megs, the L2 cache is 24 and the L3 cache is 128 megabytes. The default TDP is 350 watts. The processor technology for the CPU cores is TSMC 5 nanometer and for the IO die is TSMC 6 nanometer. The CPUs are able to be overclocked. They are Expo enabled. They do have PBO. You also have the ability to use curve optimizer voltage offsets. The CPU socket as known is STR5 with the socket set of TRX50. Supported extensions, I'll just put a list in front of you, but very importantly, it does still include AVX 512. Also something important to note is the max operating temperature, the TJ Max, which is at 95. So if you hit past 95, it'll start choking, but this is something important for when we get into the results. For connectivity, the PCIe version is 5.0. For the amount of lanes, it has a total of 92, but usable 88 lanes, which is massive. As mentioned before, it uses DDR5 RDIMMs. There are four memory channels, which is also extremely important because that obviously is very effective for workflow. It does say it supports up to 5200, but I did 6000 pretty easily, and I have seen a lot of reviews at 6400 being the sweet spot. Lastly, it does have ECC support or error code correcting support. Note that there is no integrated graphics, so you are going to need a dedicated graphics card. 
From the lineup, we need to understand that this is an HEDT series or high-end desktop series. And I think the naming is where the confusion or the misplacement comes. It would be far more apt to actually name this SEDT or Specialist End Desktop. I think the marketing of previous generations also didn't help. If we looked at the motherboards, we saw that they were RGB motherboards, they looked like gaming motherboards, even though at that time there were better CPUs for gaming. So I think that has a part to play in the kind of build up in our minds as to what Threadripper was designed for. So this brings me back to my original point in that just because something can do something doesn't mean that it should. Just because it can game doesn't mean that it should be gaming. Yes, it can game. And the fact that AMD put so much damn L3 cash in doesn't help my argument. Last points on this before we move on to the results I promise is an analogy. A lot of people think of a Threadripper as the highest end, which it is, but they think of it in terms of Fiat, Lexus, Ferrari, when in actual fact it's Fiat, Lexus, Thrust CSS. You're going to need a specialist driver or a specialist in order to get the best performance out of the CPU. So let's dive into the results, but note that I only have the results from the 7960X. I do have the 7985WX and I'll put that in when I've actually done that, but I have put the best derivatives for the results. Important to note before we go into the actual results, the CPU was obviously the 7960X. The motherboard was a Gigabyte TRX50 Aero. The RAM was from Kingston 6000 MHz RDIMS CL32. The SSD or SSDs were the Crucial T700 1TB. The PSU was a RAID Max 1000 Watt. The GPU was a Gigabyte Aero 4060. The cooler was the NZXT Kraken Elite 360 RGB. The case was the NZXT H7 Flow. And the thermal compound used was the Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut. Starting off with Y Cruncher because I like to use Y Cruncher to show system stability. When I ran Y Cruncher, I didn't really put a end time, so it just ran through iteration after iteration after iteration. So it ran for quite a long time, and I found the system to be really stable. So once I was happy with that and the system stability, we moved on to the actual results. Starting off with PT11 or Performance Test 11 on CPU Mark, we hit a score of 84,428 for the 24 core 48 thread processor. This was a massive score if we look at its brothers or peers. Now I put a list of all of them down there with their core count as well as thread count, but the 7975 hitting 100,760, the 7980X hitting 137,735, the older generation 3960X hitting 50,835, the good old faithful Ryzen 7950X3D hitting a 62,632, then just some Intel comparatives, we have the Xeon W9 3495X, which is a 56 core 112 thread, hitting 96,747. Then another CPU that we all know well, the 4900KF hitting 59,388. For 3D Mark, oddly enough, all AMD because these are the last CPUs that I've reviewed. But starting off at the top, the 7960X hitting a 19,081. Now, the next result I actually forgot to do, so I quickly tested it off my own system. So the result might be a bit inaccurate because of a saturated system, but still 14,437. The 7900X3D 11,609, the 7800X3D 7,835, and the 7600X 7,192. Looking at CPU-Z single thread performance, we have the 7960X coming in at 757. Now the 7950X had a higher score of 767 and this is because of its focus on single core performance. Same thing with the 7700X having a 774. Then we have the Intel 13900K at 893 and the Intel i7 14700KF at 908. So obviously the CPU is more focused on multi-threaded performance which we'll get to now. On multi-threaded performance, the 7960X came in at a score of 22,009. Now if we compare that to the 3970X from the previous generation which had 64 threads, that hit a score of 21,029. So a nice generational leap showing that the threads are more efficient. And then the 3960X or base equivalent 16,025. So again, showing the massive generational improvement. 
Moving on to Cinebench. Now for Cinebench, I did Cinebench 2024 and R23. Now I will get to overclocking, but I just noted something a little bit interesting. So I put two sets of data for the CPU in the Windows Profiles Balanced and Performance Profiles. Now, if we look at multi-core performance, the CPU did a 2920 for the balanced profile and for performance, a 2902. Now, this was over multiple tests, showing that the CPU actually prefers the balanced profile. If we look at the rest of the scores, the 7980X hit a 5531, the 7950X3D hitting a 2108, and the i9-14900KF hitting a 2211. For the single core performance, and now this is just more for interest, on the balance profile, it hit a lower score of 117. Again, I had to do this multiple times to actually prove this right. But for the performance profile, we hit one point higher in 118. The 7980X hitting a score of 115, the 3960X 81, the 7950X3D 121, and the 14900KF 139. Moving on to Cinebench R23 with the same principles in mind. Balanced for the CPU hit a score of 52,844, whereas performance mode 51,657. Looking at the rest of the scores, we have a mammoth coming in from the 7980X of 98,322, the previous generation 3960X hitting a 34,255, the 7950X3D hitting a 38,581 and lastly the 14900KF hitting a score of 38,649 for reference. Single core performance on balanced hit 1924, performance profile hit 1944. Then for the rest of the scores, the 3960X 1270, the 7950X3D hitting a 2043, and the 14900KF hitting a 2358. So at least for Cinebench, showing that the balance profile from Windows is the far better setting for getting the all round better performance out of the CPU. Onto Blender Benchmark, I hit a score of 801 on the 7960X, for the 7980X, it was an average score of 1734. Previous generation 3960X, 496. The 7950X3D, 540. And the 14900KF, 539. So some other scores coming in from Ada64. I don't want to linger on this too long because I don't have comparative data, so it doesn't really matter. But you can pause here just to be able to look at the scores. Same thing for 7-Zip as well as Spec Workstation, which I do have the results, but for me, they were a little bit diluted and not accurate enough. And I think that was mirrored across the reviewing world. On to stats, starting with the temperature. Now note that TJ Maxx is 95. So anything that would hit 95 means that we have a bottleneck result. Now for Cinebench 2024, we had a max of 95. For R23, we had a max of 95. For Ada, we had a max of 97 because why not? Ada just wanted to go above TJ Maxx. Then for Blender, we hit 95. So for me overall, this means that the CPU has a little bit more performance left in it. And if we can get a cooler, this is nothing on the Kraken, but it doesn't cover the entire IHS. So if we get something that covers the entire IHS, I believe that we're gonna be able to get even better results out of the CPU. And this would mean we need to get something that is dedicated for the Threadripper 7000 series or TR5. Something really important for me, if you look at ADA CPU and FPU stress on the graphic or capture that you can see in front of you, the per core efficiency is something pretty amazing because you can see as soon as it starts bottlenecking, it's immediately switching in between CCDs because obviously which core is on which CCD. But it's important to note that we look at the core temperature and then we look at the actual die temperature and there is a big difference between there, which is normal. But again, this reiterates a point that as soon as we have better IHS cover, we're gonna be able to see a lot better results coming out of the CPU. Moving on to the power draw, Cinebench 2024 hit a max of 321, R23, 345, Ada hitting a 349, and Blender a 341. So sticking well within the limits of the 350 that AMD promises. Lastly, let's look at the frequencies. Now you'll see two measures in front of you, max frequency and core effective. Note that there's a big difference between the max and the core effective, and it seems to be spikes past the allowance of 5,300. However, Cinebench 2024 hits a max of 5,639 and a core effective of 4,806. 
For Cinebench R23, a max of 5639 as well, and a core effective of 4826. Ada, a max of 5634 with a core effective of 4807. And lastly, Blender with a score of 5340, more in line with AMD's reports, and the core effective of 4806. Now, another little interesting snippet that I pulled out was to watch the core ratio chain. For Blender, a nice little takeaway, you can see on the capture in front of you how beautiful, at least for me, how beautiful it was to see the ratio changes in how the CPU actually worked in order to make sure that it was reaching max efficiency. Note that overall, there was no PBO enacted, so we can expect these results to vastly change for everything over time. Just an important note on the results, I was using the NZXT Kraken Elite 360. Now this wasn't originally designed for TR5, yes it could be used on TR4, but it wasn't designed for TR5. Now the results are really good, but I think because of the CCD placement as well as core density, when we have coolers that can cover the entire IHS, we will be able to see better results coming out of the CPU specifically. On to the conclusion, the CPU is best utilized with heavy threaded applications in the name Threadripper. Therefore, the best application for the CPU are for people that do things like simulation, 3D design and modeling, rendering, need multiple PCIe lanes, game design, animation, and compiling. Now, if your eyes have been glazed over for a lot of this review because of the mass amounts of information, here comes the most important part. If you are not buying the CPU as a specialist, you can buy it as a coverall, knowing that it can do pretty much everything and everything well. But just note that there are some things that other CPUs do better, and the one big example that we have seen is in programs like Adobe Suite. There are four scenarios in that you would want the CPU. The first is you've got way too much money and you just want the best. The second is you are a specialist and this offers productivity and efficiency. The third is you are a heavy user that has multiple programs open at the same time, either active programs or passive programs in the back. The fourth would be a blend of points two and three, where you are a specialist and you do need to have multiple programs open at the same time. So now down to the crux. Should you buy one? Yes. No. Maybe. I don't know. Can you repeat the question? It is a specialist CPU and it is an investment. And an investment by nature needs to yield a return. So how can you look at this? If you are able to do say three to six renders a day and that makes you hundred dollars or a hundred rand but now the CPU allows you to double that output and you have the capacity to double that output this could theoretically double your revenue generation so if you look at it from that front as an investment into your equipment and this is actually going to make you more productive then this is definitely something that you want to consider otherwise refer to points one to four there are still many other things that I want to cover that I'll cover in later reviews. I just don't want this video to be too long. I'll do things like overclocking, path tracing, etc., etc. But until then, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Cheers. Goodbye.